I am super, super excited uh, for today's office hours. If you guys haven't done an office hours before with Supply Pike, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's basically, you know, if you guys remember being in college doing office hours there where your professor is just like, hey, I'm here. If you've got questions, let's talk about anything you want to. Um, and today we will be talking with Jessica, of course. She is a former revenue recovery manager, um, and she has a lot of really, really awesome insight to share with us. So. Um, uh, really quickly, wanted to do a super quick intro. So if you guys uh, haven't seen me before, my name is Stacy. I lead the Retail Insights team here at Supply Pike, been with the company uh, for close to four years now, which is kind of crazy to say. Uh, but yeah, I love being able to kind of, I, I joke, I translate English to English <laughs> between the supplier teams that we work with and the internal teams that we have here at Supply Pike. And I am joined by Jessica today. It is her very first webinar that she is going to be leading. So I'm super excited <laughs> about that. Um, Jessica comes to us with a ton of experience in the revenue recovery space. Um, she actually used to work at Harry's um, and has actually had built up a team that was dedicated to recovering revenue for the company. And Jessica, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that as well. Yeah, I think, you know, like Stacey said, um, I managed a revenue recovery team that kind of started from nothing. You know, Harry's wasn't really managing deductions or chargebacks in a in really any process, it was kind of managed between two teams. So I was kind of tasked with building that function, learning everything from the ground up. So I've seen it all and happy to really get to meet everyone today and chat chat through more of how, how my experience can help all of you. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. Um, okay. So a really quick high level uh, overview of our agenda today, really easy stuff, which is nice. Uh, we're going to spend the first couple of minutes kind of setting the scene and setting the stage on revenue loss. Um, you know, I know a lot of folks work with Supply Pike to address that. So we always like to make sure that we're on the same page before we kind of deep dive into that. Um, and then once we've covered really, really high level revenue loss buckets, um, we're then going to pivot into office hours. And this is the part where I'm really going to encourage you guys uh, to send in questions. If you have any, we've got a couple that were sent in before the webinar. So we'll kind of kick off with that. But if you guys have any burning, yearning questions where you're like, boy, I sure wish I know, you know, could find this out about revenue loss or how a company like Harry's manage their revenue loss, what are best practices, what are benchmarks, um, please feel free to throw those um, in the Q&A section and we will definitely, I'll be moderating the questions and, and calling those out to Jessica um, and kind of carrying on the conversation that way. So um, really quick on the FAQs, will you get a copy of the slide deck? Yes, you will. Um, we will be sending the slide deck as well as a recording of this whole webinar to your inbox, whichever email that you use to sign up for the webinar um, in about three to four business days. Sometimes we can get it out a bit faster, but we always like to give ourselves a little bit of buffer time. Um, and then also, what is the best way to ask the question? So um, if you guys look at your Zoom tab um, at the very bottom of the screen, you'll notice there is uh, two speech bubbles, and that is the Q&A button. If you utilize that to send in your questions, we would really appreciate it um, just because it's easier for us to keep track of those questions, uh, making sure that, that all of those are answered. Um, but you can also utilize the chat button, which is just the one speech bubble. And that is great for any kind of um, chat or information that you want to share, any experiences or insights that you have for your company. Um, please feel free to add it to, to that chat. So questions in the Q&A section and chat using the chat button. Um, so without, uh, I'm going to do a really quick intro um, and then I will hand it off to Jessica in a second. Um, we always like to do super quick introduction on Supply Pike in case this is the first time you guys are joining us. Um, but we are a Northwest Arkansas based software company um, and we create cloud-based tools to help our CPG partners reduce revenue loss. So that is kind of our main focus. And we do that by automatically detecting and resolving retailer compliance issues. So uh, we have a deductions tool that is there to essentially help you um, identify whenever you get deductions, uh, decide if they're valid or not, automatically gather proof documentation and actually automatically submit them for you. Uh, we also have a compliance arm that really focuses on things like OTIF fines and SQEP fines that come out of Walmart. Um, and so kind of 
by those two powers combined, we're able to tackle pretty much the entire gamut of the revenue loss space. Um, so we work with about 400 companies today, representing over $25 billion in retail impact um, across just about any product category you can think of. So um, these are some of the brands that we're proud to consider part of the Supply Pike family. Um, and hopefully if we're not working with you guys today, we will be able to add you to the Supply Pike family one day. Um, yeah, so very last thing I'll say is um, we will actually be hosting an in-person event uh, next week, which we are super excited about. Uh, if you guys are selling to Walmart, um, you have probably heard of something called Item 360, which is the item setup and maintenance um, application within Retail Link. We get a lot of questions <laughs> about Item 360 which we totally understand there is a lot to know. Um, so we will be hosting Dee Dee Washburn. She is an item 360 expert um, and she will be kind of walking us through the app application and then also answering any questions that you guys may have. So um, if you're in Northwest Arkansas, it will be at the Supply Chain Hall of Fame. So that's over by Topgolf. Um, we will be having coffee. There will be breakfast. There will be a lot of swag um, in addition to the education. So if you're in Northwest Arkansas, please join us next week on the 19th. Um, and if not, you can also uh, you can also register for a live stream. We'll be live streaming the event as well. So if you're not in the area, no worries, you'll still be able to join in on the fun. Um, okay, so that is all I've got, Jessica. Um, I'm going to hand it off to you to kind of introduce us to revenue loss, and then we can start to take questions. So again, guys, if you have questions, please feel free to start dropping them into the Q&A section. Awesome. Thanks, Stacey. So today we're just going to do a really quick overview here, um, just jumping into some of the common types of revenue loss that we see um, managing, you know, the chargeback world as, as my team used to call it. So kind of jumping into invoice deductions, these are going to be your typical deductions that you see come, coming in day in, day out from the retailer whether that be shortages, damages, substitutions, pricing discrepancies, duplicate billing, you know, whether those be valid or invalid, um, those are definitely the ones that you're going to want to research a little bit more and understand whether or not you're going to want to actually dispute those. And then, of course, understanding whether or not you'll want to dive into some root cause analysis to understand kind of where are they coming from? How can we mitigate any of these going forward? Um, so recovering money, but then also making sure you're getting ahead of any potential um, issues within your company that you'll want to work to reduce these overall. Um, and then you're going to have also some negotiated expected. We called these contractual within Harry's. Um, well, we knew they, we were pre-negotiated within our supplier agreement, whether that be some kind of allowance, might be a promotion, it might be a co-op, some kind of cash discount. This could even be payment terms. It just really depends on what your specific agreement is with the retailer. Um, but these ones you should be able to forecast out because hopefully you might have a percent that you've agreed upon with the retailer. If not, this is probably something I would advise to speak with your buyer and figure out if you're able to kind of negotiate um, maybe a, a percent uh, off of your con uh, off of your invoices in order to be able to track those more easily. And then you won't have to worry about disputing those. Um, but there could be times where you do get, you know, charged for them above and beyond what you've negotiated. And then of course, those are, those are circumstances in which you'd want to dispute, but these are, I would expect they would want to hopefully stay within a certain barrier, but of course the retailer will always surprise us. So um, jumping into the next bucket here, we also have those compliance fines. So depending on the retailer OTIF, um, like for Walmart, it might be OTFR for Target, but basically talking about how we're on time and in full and all those fees and fines that we typically see on the front end from our retailer. Um, you know, we know that they're constantly changing these guidelines as we know SQEP is coming for Walmart now. Um, but basically just understanding what those standards of compliance are within each retailer so you can get ahead proactively. Um, so you're making sure that your supply chain is running as efficiently as possible and to avoid any of those fines. Um, we also would use these fines as indicators and signals to understand what deductions are we going to get later on. If, if you know you're not in full, there's you know, potential that you might get a shortage down the line as a deduction. If you're not on time, you might get a late shipping deduction down the road. So definitely want to use these as um, proactive indicators of what you may see in deductions later down the road. Um, and then lastly, audits. These are definitely more few and far between. Um, we typically would see them usually annually. 
from Walmart specifically. Um, but really, again, just it's going to be dependent on your business specifically. You'll want to make sure that you're going into these reading as much as possible to understand if they're valid and whether or not you would want to dispute those as well. Something that you would want to speak with your buyer about um, and something you want to understand for future forecasting to understand, oh, do I need to leave room in my budget for potential audit purposes there too. So those are kind of the four big buckets that we see in revenue loss um, and definitely would want to advise to just have a basic handle on all four of these as you're kind of navigating the revenue loss field for, for your company. So what I was kind of mentioning before and disputing whether you'll you know understand whether those deductions are valid or invalid, we know that the retailer is going to always try to ding us in some way. So we know that the deductions or compliance fees and fines might not always be valid. So it's really, really important to actually dig into these and spend some time really doing some root cause analysis to understand whether or not they are valid or invalid. And, you know, what my team really did, and this took time, but was to really understand how we can be pro proactive and really look look at preventing a lot of these fines versus actually being reactive and having to wait one to two months down the line to understand what's going on. So I do really believe and feel passionately about making sure your team is doing a good balance of spending time on disputing and recovering all as much money as possible. But then that other flip side of the coin is really digging into project management, figuring out those work streams that need to be created on root cause analysis and root cause analysis and what is actually driving those deductions and fines for your company. So it could be, you know, EDI issues, IT issues, whether that be order management problems, you know, labeling, there's so many reasons. So I think it just is really um, an important tactic to find a way to collaborate with your team on understanding where they're coming from, because that will lower your impact of deductions and fines overall going forward. So now we're going to jump into some questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. So we received a really interesting question um, that I would love to get your feedback on, Jessica. So you mentioned the kind of four different silos of revenue loss, which isn't it so fun, all the different ways retailers <laughs> are creative with getting money. Could you talk through, um, the question is, could you talk through your prioritization of these four buckets? Um, was there a particular one? Was it just by like the number of dollars that were deducted from you guys? Was it, yeah, like what was your prioritization for that? Definitely. I think, um, so a few different things to understand here. I think the negotiated and expected is like its own silo that you want to kind of have a handle on. You know, those are typically negotiated through the sales team. So I would really, for forecasting purposes, make sure that I was tracking those, um, whether that be an Excel spreadsheet, Google sheet, whatever it is, um, and get sign off for my sales team that I was staying up to date on what all of those contractual terms were. So that when budgeting season came, I would be able to just kind of refresh those by retailer, get their sign off and feel like, okay, I could forecast these out. I know what these are. So that was kind of, you know, and then track those from coming in um, monthly to make sure that they were actually what we expected them to be. And if they weren't, you know, dig into those as needed with my sales team. Um, so that was kind of like a very siloed piece of it for us. And then, you know, in the beginning of when I started this, we definitely focused on dollar impact and deductions. I think what we learned throughout the process is really making sure that we were balancing, understanding what that compliance fines were going to be as a signal of what those deductions were and not waiting one to two months down the line once that deduction came in and then fight that, but actually proactively be running reports, understanding what's happening in the compliance field, fight those invalid fines, understand the valid ones, create root cause solutions against the compliance piece. So then you can then go back and prioritize the disputes in which actually were valid. That made sense. Um, so I think Overall, from a prioritization perspective, you know, fighting the valid disputes from a do the highest dollar impact were definitely the most important. And then, of course, whatever was going to be the biggest percent to that specific retailer um, and how it is, was uh, basically impacting that retailer from a chargeback rate perspective, those were ones that we would focus on on the most. But biggest dollar impact was always going to be 
the sure. focus, get as much money back as we can. <laughs> sure. Completely understand. And, and if I'm not mistaken, Jessica, your team was responsible for, I think, was it over 30 or 40 retailers, which yeah. I can't even imagine. Um, were the different retailers have different pain points? So like maybe I'm making this up, but you know, Walmart tended to have a really big invoice deduction issue and maybe Kroger had a really big um, negotiated or expected fine issue. Um, how did you prioritize kind of between retailers? Um, like what did that matrix look like for yeah. you guys? No, it's a great, that's a great question. I think, you know, obviously the highest dollar volume is of course always going to be where we would start. But I think for us specifically at Harry's, you know, Walmart, Target, and Amazon made up about 85% of the pie for us. So those three retailers, even though we managed oh, over 40 retailers, you know, and received deductions from over 40 retailers, the majority of our time was going to be spent on those three, just knowing if we make an impact here, we can really reduce this problem overall for the company. Um, but I think, you know, we definitely saw probably all of these from all of them. But I think, you know, the ones that were outweighed were probably, you know, shortages, of course, are always outweighed, I think, for all three of them. Um, we saw a lot of pricing discrepancies on the Amazon side, EDI discrepancies on the Amazon side, um, but the shortages overall day in and day out were definitely the, the biggest ones we saw in pain points. And I think after speaking to a lot of suppliers now, you know, we know that that's definitely an, an issue that most suppliers face. So if that's an issue for you, you're not alone. A lot of other suppliers are seeing that. And we have ways, you know, help, obviously you guys dig into that for, for your business specifically as well. Right. Yeah. No, that's really, really insightful. And I'm I'm kind of curious, Jessica. So we, we just got a question. Um, and it's so SQEP is a new uh category of fine at Walmart. Um, can you talk about where like did this fall under your team? Did it fall under the supply chain team? Um, I think uh, you know, as you know, a lot of suppliers that we work with are really curious about like how, what is a, what's, what does a best in class team look like when you're thinking about team structure? Mm -hmm. um, you know, as we know, historically kind of any sort of revenue loss pretty much just lived on the finance side. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you kind of, you get the deduction, you get the fine and you go like, well, that's not great, but that's the cost of doing business with insert retailer here and you know you kind of either write it off try to fight it and then you move on but i know you know earlier you were mentioning like hey you know we worked with the sales team we worked with the mm -hmm. transportation team so what did your team structure look like if you wouldn't mind sharing no of course so i think you know all of this did fall within my team you know even though we were actually negotiating the negotiated chargebacks and deductions, <laughs> we owned that responsibility of making sure we were budgeting them appropriately across all retailers and disputing ones that were invalid, so on and so forth. But everything did fall within our team. I think what was really unique about Harry's revenue recovery structure, I think I'm finding is very unique after talking to more suppliers is our team actually sat on the supply chain team. Okay. So a lot of our background did come from supply chain. So we were able to understand a lot of the ins and outs of, okay, who do we go to, to actually understand SQEP? Okay. I need to loop in my logistics and transportation team. I need to work with my distribution team, you know, obviously on the contractual side, I need to work with sales. Um, but I think, you know, the way that we really, I think we're able to work well cross-functionally would, and my advice would be to set up those recurring meetings with those key players and stakeholders that actually touch the deductions and compliance fines in your company. So for me personally, again, that was mostly logistics and distribution. You know, we'd have those more in-depth conversations and talks, um, whether that be in a specific work stream for root cause analysis or, you know, maybe we would bring in the EDI and IT team if that was something that was necessary or accounting or sales. Um, but for reoccurring meetings, you know, it's really important to be working with those people that are actually touching operations that can signal those fees and fines and be able to tell you, oh, hey, we actually cut this order. or That truck was late. We mm -hmm. know we did. We did this or, oh, no, we didn't do that. So like, let's fight it. And then you're working proactively, whether that be weekly or biweekly, you know, we would do weekly meetings for Walmart, Target and Amazon so that we knew we pull those compliance reports, you know, 
dig through them, understand, okay, now we all have our marching orders of kind of where to go from here. Oh, I need to fix this, or we need to dig into that. We need to dispute this. And it really enabled us to hold each piece of the team accountable for how they were actually submitting and fulfilling orders, you know, routing orders, um, and then making sure that the core team, accounting, sales, transportation, supply chain are all looped into what's going on? Like what's actually happening based on how we're sending orders out into the world? And is, is it go, how is it going? You know, and how are we impacting the company financially by, by what we're doing? And it, it really builds great rapport for your team dynamic. And at Harry's, we used to say all in all together. And I think that really tr truly helped us lower our chargeback impact is have that collaborative team working to make sure that we can understand where all these charges are coming from. <laughs> no, I, I love that. And I find it really cool that you guys kind of had a hybrid set of skills and knowledge and experience, because obviously I'm generalizing very heavily here, but again, kind of the traditional way of working is you have your transportation logistics team, like they can answer any question you have about POs that have been cut and, you know, things like that and warehousing questions, but they may not necessarily understand understand how it's being applied financially, or you may have your finance team, which can reconcile like nobody's business, exactly. <laughs> but may not understand how and why POs are cut or canceled. So that's really interesting that, you know, Harry's had a team that it seemed kind of sat in between mm -hmm. everybody. Right. Um, so what, what kind of skill sets did your team have, Jessica? So when you were looking to hire for your team, like what type of folks were you looking for? Like folks I mean, with supply chain yeah. experience or? Yeah, I think supply chain experience is so key. And I think, like I said, that's why I really loved that we sat on the supply chain side and that, you know, Harry's really brought me on because of my supply chain experience, because we can look through these deductions and kind of sort of start to understand where in the supply chain is this being driven from? Mm -hmm. Is it an IT problem I need to loop IT in or is it logistics? It's transportation or it's a routing problem. I need to talk to my distribution team. Like, I think it's helpful when you have that back end knowledge on your team that they could just jump in and start root causing and really be able to point them in the right direction of what teams it can. And then could sit on different teams, right? Sales, it could even be helpful. You know, accounting, of course, is going to be helpful. Um, but I think supply chain for sure is probably the most important because that's where all these deductions are stemming from, for the most part. Okay. Um, as well as just analytical, right? We're pulling reports, we're digging in, we're going to be granular. Yeah, you know, I was we need say, to know yeah. the nitty gritty details of all of our spreadsheets. Yes, yeah, every so. every supplier's obsession with spreadsheets. I, I fully <laughs> understand. I remember that life <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'm I'm kind of curious, Jessica. So you know, obviously you collaborated with a lot of different teams, like you mentioned your sales and distribution and finance and supply chain. So what KPIs were you guys? actually accountable for. So obviously, you know, collaboration is a big deal, but at the end of the day, everyone is kind of trying to, you know, optimize to the numbers that they need to hit. So for you guys, what, what was that number? What KPIs did you look at? Um, you know, what was considered good or bad for Harry's, if you wouldn't mind sharing? Of course. So I was responsible for the entire, you know, line item on the profit, profit and loss statement, in the PNL of the chargeback dollar and and rate impact to the company. Then of course, open that up by, by retailer. So I essentially had to break down each of these buckets for every single retailer by dollar and rate. And that's what I was held to in the forecast, you know, from a yearly perspective, I'd, I'd map that out for the entire year. Um, I would do this by month, by quarter, and then of course, re-forecast, re-budget and have all that information. So I was held to that, those numbers every single month. Um, so of course, if one real little retailer was off, you know, that was always so tough because you're hoping another retailer would make up for it and surprise mm -hmm. you or you get more money back than you expected to. Um, and then from like a KPI perspective, the things that our team really focused on and really worked through um, with the supply chain team to focus on was, of course, what is our win rate with disputing? How much are we actually recovering by retailer? And what does that mean? Like in a given month, like you might have a 50% win rate, but is that because you couldn't get the documentation that you needed? Like, or we know we had a supply chain issue that was going on. Like, what's the context in that sure. figure? It's going to be different based on what's going on in your company and the nuance of that. And I think, you know, what's the dispute? We used to call it a dispute rate. So like, how much am I actually disputing 
of the deductions that are sitting out there. And then again, to, of that specific month, what's going on? Are, are you focusing on historical months? What's happening in that current month? You know, whatever is actually going on in your team to understand what is that metric actually telling us? And then the biggest one and the biggest, I'd say for us, health metric of the whole company, and we would do this by retailer, was what is that chargeback rate? So really being able to understand what is that percent of chargeback dollars to gross revenue dollars? Mm -hmm. That is the key indicator of how healthy that business's deductions are. You know, so being able to understand industry benchmarking, like best in class would be 1% of a retailer's business would be chargebacks. That was like, Things are running smoothly. Supply chain's healthy. <laughs> We've disputed <laughs> a ton. We're getting money back. Things are good. You know, 1% or lower, I would say, is, is relatively really healthy. Mm. Um, but then, you know, there are companies that we, we speak with and, of course, clients we have and suppliers out there that could be high as 10% and, of course, right. want to lower that, you know. So um, I think it's really that's the key metric to understand is you might have a high dollar impact at a company for their deductions, but it might only be 1%, right? So uh, being able to understand what is that actual impact to that retailer and understanding within your retailer base, who's outsized so that you can kind of focus on, on the ones that are outsized to the rest. No, that makes a lot of sense, Jessica. And for those of you guys who are kind of on the call and, and maybe if you're not already working with Supply Pike, so we're able to pull that for you if you're a Supply Pike customer. But if you're not, just so you guys have context, as Jessica mentioned, kind of best in class in the industry is 1% and below. On average, the you know what we see with folks kind of just, we work with about 500 customers today. Um, it's usually anywhere between four to 6%. Um, and that is kind of before working with Supply Pike. Um, and then of course, our goal is to help you kind of drop that down. So um, just to give you guys some context on, you know, if you, if you wanted to go back and look within your own company, like, Hey, what does that number look like? Again, four to six is what we see on average best in class is, is 1%. So um, yeah, that's kind of some, some interesting stats for sure. Um, so you mentioned Jessica that, you know, you, you obviously collaborated a lot with your teens um, you mentioned a lot of spreadsheets. <laughs> so what could, could you mind sharing? Like, what did reporting look like for you guys? Like, how were you pulling it together? What sort of numbers were you showing? How often were you show, showing reporting? Like, what did that cadence look like? Yeah. So we pulled a lot of reports. I think, you know, obviously since I started the function from the ground up, it was kind of like, how do we educate the company on what's happening here? What do we need to show to, to show them, you know, this is the real impact of, you know, just dollars and cents to the company and who's actually driving that, right? So we would provide a monthly breakdown. So based on what how those that month's deductions came in, kind of where we came in against our budget, that again, dollars and rate um, based on gross revenue. And then typically we would do a breakdown for those big, what we used to call the big three, Walmart, Target, and Amazon. I'm kind of showing where those dollars and rates came in. And then also a breakdown of all the category information. So like, what's the penetration of my shortages versus pricing? You know, where's ED, where's the EDI and operational chargebacks coming in? You know, being able to actually give, you know, people in the company who are touching it and affecting, you know, sales obviously wants to understand it. Where is it coming from, right? Like, what are the areas that are being affected in Walmart versus Target versus Amazon? Um, so that was something that we would provide. And then any nuance, right? Like if something came out of the blue that we didn't expect, oh, we have this $200,000 fine that we received from that Walgreens. Never that never happens. <laughs> we would want to always provide that context. Hey, we missed budget because we received this audit, this post audit from Walgreens for a shrink allowance that we did not expect to receive, which did happen to us. I will never forget it. $194,000 that we <laughs> Burned in your memory forever. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but things like that, that of course you might be hitting all your things, things are going well, but you got to, you got to provide that visibility to the team. So they understand kind of what, again, that nuance is across your retailer base. And we would kind of provide for us, like, again, we had, you know, over 40 retailers, but we would kind of look at that top, like six or seven that were our biggest impact areas um, and really be able to give that high level breakdown so everyone can kind of see and, and again, hold the teams accountable for where, where we were driving towards as goal. Um, and then weekly, I think we also pulled the compliance reporting weekly 
What, what are we seeing weekly coming in for on time and in full? What fines are we, do we think we're going to be getting um, for visibility purposes for the supply chain team, making sure that they were aware, hey, like we thought everything really went well with this new launch, but no, it actually didn't. <laughs> oh, no. And now we need to fix that, right? So how do we make sure that we're on top of it? So we would do weekly reporting and then the deduction reporting and more more um, month end information we'd provide that quarterly as well as yearly as as we kind of grew the function out we wanted to start providing benchmarks year over year information month over right. month information to just start to be able to have a real grasp and understanding of what is this business it's so variable it's changing all the time how do we get a handle on on what this is you know and give make sure that all of the key stakeholders are a part of this so we can really work as a team to to fix it as much as possible. No, I love I love that. And and we actually had a really I think relevant and interesting question come in Jessica. Um so what bucket did you guys put customer returns in? Um so did you did Harry's include returns in your overall chargeback percentage? Did it fall under kind of your team's responsibility or where where did that fall? So great question. This was through experience, a very messy (laughs) way for us to figure this out for better or worse. So we used to bucket all of it into deductions and into what we called controllable. So everything that's in deductions, we called controllable because we felt we could potentially avoid them. Um, So we had them there, but then we soon found out that some of our retailers had terms for returns. So some of our retailers' returns would sit in the negotiated and expected bucket, and some Mm. would sit in the deduction bucket. So again, this is really going to be based on your supplier agreement, specifically with each retailer and understanding, do you guys have an agreement on returns? If you don't, then I would think it would sit in the deduction bucket, and it could be something that is disputed. Um, But if if you do have terms on it, okay, how is that coming in for the month? Does it align with the terms that we have? Mm-hmm. And if not, should we dispute? Should we reach out to our buyer and discuss that return um, more significantly? So definitely going to be a conversation starter for your team, I'm sure. Um, but that's where I think the nuance comes into play when you're managing multiple retailers. It's just not going to be the same um, against each one. So hope okay. that answered your question. Wow, super helpful. And um, I've got a question. So you've kind of talked about negotiated and expected being something that, you know, generally speaking, is exactly what it sounds like negotiated and expected. <laughs> um, did you, was your team ever responsible for trying to get this down or changing it? Did this live purely in sales? It seems kind of almost like a, a conflict is kind of strong, but, you know, you guys are kind of held to the number that a different team is negotiating. So how did you guys navigate those waters? Yeah, it was definitely tough. I think the thing that was the most important thing to do when I first started, when I learned basically that that's the world in which we live in is there's deductions that we don't expect and there's ones we do, right? So I think the education piece to leadership is extremely important to make sure you're breaking those things down so they know we don't just have this huge lump sum of fines we're getting that we're causing, right? Like we signed up for these as a company. We made an agreement with our with our retailer that we are going to be deducted for these specific things. So I think For us, that was why we had controllable and contractual. Make sure that you're giving that education and visibility to all all major leadership teams. For us, it was up to the CEO really cared about that to know, okay, good. I don't care about, he would, (laughs) our CEO would say, okay, controllable, you know, contractual, got it. Like, makes sense to me. Let's talk about this controllable market, right? (laughs) And how can we actually bring that down? But then it gives them a little bit feeling like they understand, okay, got it, like, this bucket, we're probably not getting anything back. So they have an understanding, like, what can we truly actually receive back? Um, But we had a lot of conversations around, you know, when things were getting better and better. um, And this is, of course, attributed to a lot of our work with Supply Pike. But when we actually had the time to really make an impact in reducing our deductions overall was where do we go from here, right? Like once we get to best in class, what else is on the table for us to do? And that's when we started talking about, okay, well, that to me is now the time 
to renegotiate, right? Like, okay, we've cleaned up our house. Our supply chain is healthy. We're running smoothly. We know a lot of the problems that we're causing our deductions. We've fixed that. We fixed a lot of things we're causing our compliance. We fixed those things. Of course, there's always going to be things that come up, but we're in a healthy place, right? This is the kind of time that I advise teams to work with sales to then go back and start negotiating because you have leverage, right? You're able to say, hey, we we dropped our our deductions by X percent, or you know, we were, you know, used to be at 80% on time and now we're at, you know, 99, whatever it may be, those give that gives you the opportunity to then have those conversations to, you know, renegotiate. We were not a part of those, but we would advise a lot of times <laughs> to see if we can bring some of those numbers down. Cause of course, that's just money in the bank, right? No, I, and I really like that mentality, Jessica. Again, I know we kind of a broken record at this point, but again, it's very common, you know, when I was in the supplier world for a long time, again, it was very siloed, right? Sales to sales, mm-hmm. supply chain to supply chain and finance to finance. And I think we are slowly like, whether we want to admit it or not, <laughs> um, programs like OTIF or ORAT or, you know, OTFR are kind of forcing, I think, um, supply chain and finance teams to really start talking to each other mm-hmm. a little bit more because, exactly. you know, Hey, it's, uh, I didn't just get this random $10,000 fine. It's, I got this random $10,000 <laughs> fine because of an OTIF or ORAT or whatever issue supply mm-hmm. chain team might need to understand that better and, or sales team might need to understand that better. So we are kind of, I think, slowly converging into that new world order. <laughs> so. Oh, for sure. Cause I mean, as we know, the retailers are only going to continue to make life difficult for the supplier. Yeah. So, you know, it's only going to benefit everyone if, you know, they're able to dig in and understand the nuance of their supply chain, get better, get paid, yes. and hopefully be happy. <laughs> <laughs> the main goal, the main goal. Um, so I want to pivot a little bit, Jessica, um, to talking about audits. So we get a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of questions about audits and I find it tends to be really seasonal. So like, we will like not have any questions. And then like in one month we have like 50 people reach out to be like, what are these post audits and what's going on? Could you talk to, talk to your experience, Jessica, like just so maybe other people have like a context and benchmark, like how often were you guys getting audits and and what was your process for dealing with that particular pain point? Totally. So we would just get these random emails <laughs> from a contact we never knew before or existed. <laughs> um, usually for us and, you know, a broken record, like I've said, we worked with over 40 retailers, but um, for us, really, the, I only really remember seeing from two, um, that being Walmart and Walgreens was who we would see some post audits come in. Um, I think the thing that's tough about these is they come in unexpectedly, right? You can't really plan for them um, unless you're someone that knows every little nitty gritty detail in your supplier agreement across every single retailer and then making sure you're you're mapping out every single data point you know, that's coming in. It's it's almost impossible to know what's going to come and whatever that variance is going to be that they're, they might say, hey, you know, we reconcile our information. Actually, we realized you would, you owe us on a co-op that you didn't actually pay us for. Or, you know, as I mentioned before, my $194,000 shrink allowance. And I think that was due to like a term that we had was because it was a multi-year agreement. That was, if we hit above a certain shrink threshold, we were going to receive. So, you know, it's definitely a tough area because you can't really plan for it. But again, we would see them few and far between, but it was just always a headache to, to have to reconcile, make sure that we were going in appropriately and understanding if they were valid, working with our teams internally to make sure, hey, does anyone have any information about three years ago when we let them know that we could sign up for this shrink allowance that we can't find anywhere. So again, keeping all of your documentation um, organized is really important. Having um, historical supplier agreements is is important when, when you're renegotiating. So you can actually go back and, and validate any of those things coming in. But um, I think, you know, that's my experience with it. From, from my experience, they were valid. So we did have to pay mm-hmm. them. And then, of course, from an education piece, could make you miss budget like it did for me. So making sure you're just educating your teams internally where where that money's going and where it came from. 
Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I just wanted to throw out there, guys, that um, we shared a couple of different resources in the chat. Um, I just wanted to share them because, again, I know post audits is <laughs> the word of the month for April, it seems. Uh, but we will be having a uh, an event, um, the post audit playbook. I believe that's actually going to be in person. So again, if you're in Northwest Arkansas, please join us. Um, if not, I also posted a link uh, for a previous webinar that we've done. You can watch it on demand um, whenever you get a chance. So um, we actually are, we've just built out uh, our team to help address some post audit questions. So we have, you know, continuing to increase the in-house expertise that we have here at Supply Pike. Um, so if you guys have any questions about post audits, please feel free to reach out to us after the webinar, or again, feel free to, to ask um, today and, and Jessica will be able to answer those questions. Um, so I did want to ask Jessica, I know you had mentioned earlier that you know, forecasting revenue loss is something that you did, which I think is the pretty, can sometimes be kind of a foreign concept for, especially if you're like a newer or a smaller supplier, right? You just kind of go, oh, well, got the shortage and that wasn't <laughs> great. So I guess I'll go dispute it. But you're saying that you guys were able to actually look out and look forward and kind of predict what was going to come in. Could you talk through that process? Like, what does that look like for you guys? Definitely. And I want to preface, I think, you know, if we're not forecasting today, it definitely is a process um, and a little bit each each forecasting cycle can, you know, create a more robust forecast in the future. And that's kind of what we did. I think our my first forecast was a number on a napkin with my CFO, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it starts, it's got to start somewhere, right? We need to be able to understand that so we can better understand um, the impact to the PNL overall, and really what room do, does the company have and really think where we're going to end up for the year? Where do we think we're going to be next year? And like, you know, if we're spending time on improving, you know, the company and we're really digging on a root cause, we should be able to, you know, lower that impact over time. It's not going to happen overnight, um, but being able to understand your retailer base and where are those, where are those um, impacts coming from? So, um, you know, it became a very robust, uh, I would say, Excel database that I created for my forecast. I unfortunately did not have a tool, which uh, if your company has forecasting tools, definitely utilize that. It would be a great way, a great resource to be able to just start inputting a lot of your data, deduction data, look at historical information and start projecting out. But I basically built some um, internal models that would pull in um, historical deductions and fees and fines. Um, and then, of course, inputting uh, with sign off from my sales team, all of these negotiated and expected um, uh, fees here and fines that we would get uh, from our retailers. So I think those were great because I would get the sign off. Those are kind of like, we know we're getting these. We have an agreement. These are the percents. And we would input all of these by percent. So everything would be a forecast by percent. Um, again, utilizing that historical information tied with where do we think we're going to be next month and future month with inputs such as what's going on in the supply chain? Where is our inventory position? Um, what's going on with that retailer? Are we getting, you know, more, in, are we in more stores or less? Kind of, it needed to be a very robust picture to understand where we were going to be. Um, so again, not an overnight process, but I think the more information you're able to put in there, the better kind of what root cause analysis projects are we working on that could help bring those rates down, those assumptions that we think we're going to get better over time. And then we would, I would work with my finance team to kind of build this robust tool. And then that would get mapped up against whatever that projected gross revenue is going to be for the quarter, for the year. Um, so then we can look at, okay, well now where is that land from a dollar's perspective? And what do we think we're going to see um, for, for chargebacks? I think Harry's was um, conservative and aggressive. We wanted to get better. We wanted to get better fast. So I think, you know, I was always kind of trying to be more conservative, you know, we want to get better, but it's going to be a slow process. And of course, there's always going to be deductions and fines that we don't expect. Um, but even building that into your tool, right? There's always going to be a level of uncertainty. So how can we how can we get smarter about it? But yeah, that was our process. Not easy one, but I do recommend trying to, to do that. And it will be very beneficial to your finance team as well as just leadership team in general. Were you forecasting, Jessica, and you may have mentioned this, I may have missed it. Were you forecasting like a yearly number? Were you forecasting down to the month, down to the 
quarter? Like how granular were you getting in your forecasts? Yeah, down to the month by retailer. So very granular, um, very tough because it, all the information that needed to go into one retailer for one month and then, and then I would have to do a whole yearly forecast for that following year um, against 45, 40, 50 <laughs> retailers. Um, a, a robust process for sure. Um, I think, as we know, there's going to be retailers that you have that probably take up the majority of that forecast. Of course, that's where I spent the most of my time knowing like Walmart, Target, Amazon. For us, that would also be Kroger, Costco, you know, Walgreens, CVS. Uh, those were the ones that were the most, you know, took up my time because I knew that they were the most um, basically of our chargeback breakdown and the impact to our company. So I wanted to make sure that I had as much information as possible. So that'd be stalking the sales team. Tell me what's going on. Are we launching new products? Are we launching new products? You know, I think it had to account for a very wide range of expectations because deductions just are tied to, as we know, everything. So, <laughs> and so you, you kind of mentioned Jessica, you mentioned a few times. So like, Obviously with forecasting, the goal is eventually you can hopefully forecast your deductions down. And then you've mentioned root cause a lot today and, and how that was a priority for Harry's. Mm -hmm. um, so could you talk through kind of just at a high level, what were some of the more tactical things that you did to, to try and root cause and then also work with those external teams to actually implement. So if you're like, hey, it is, you know, we've, we've found out because of this squat fine, it's an ASN transmitting issue. Mm -hmm. You know, how did you get to that information? And then how did you work with the team that is in charge with ASN to be like, okay, guys, I'm going to actually need you to implement this and we're going to track it to make sure we don't get hit with those fines again later on. Like, what did the, yeah. the tactical side look like for you? For sure. And I, and I want to preface with, with, of course, I was a client of Supply Pikes before I am now an employee. Um, so I think, you know, bringing on the software for Supply Pike with Walmart really freed up our time to actually be able to root cause, right? When you're just disputing all day long, there's not enough time in the day to actually start working on projects. So one, automating disputing freed up our time, then to be able to focus on root cause analysis. And I think that it was, you know, a big learning curve for us to try to understand how do we do this? So I had a team of analysts who were actually working on the disputing, you know, probably 50 to 75% of the time. And then I basically spearheaded project management and different work streams. So what we would essentially do is let's break down an example. Shortage is our biggest problem. Okay. Let's pull an example of one target shortage. Okay. Who do we need on the call? Who can touch that one target PO order? Let's have a logistic target logistics person on the call. Let's have our distribution target person on the call, our target sales person, our EDI person, maybe even our 3PL. And we would go through the entire life cycle of that PO to understand, okay, this is the retailer source of truth. Here's what we said we did. Let's look at our BOL. Let's look at that raw EDI. Let's look at what the order was coming into our ERP. What's not right? What's not matching up? Where is that source of inaccuracy? And let's say we got to the entire point of actually getting on the truck and leaving and everything still looked accurate from our perspective, then we would start to be able to understand, okay, maybe it's something upon receiving. Could mm -hmm. that be a labeling issue? Is it something from an EDI perspective upon receiving an invoicing issue? Let's look at the invoice data. What's actually going on that's going to drive that? And that would then create that work stream, right? We would be able to know, okay, if it's an EDI issue, we're going to work internally on our EDI process, understand what that is. Okay, we know we cut this order and it's not showing up within, you know, the system. Okay, we need to we need to work on our how we're order our order basically allocation processes within our ERP. We know something's not right. You know, what what is that basically first little nugget that's going to drive <laughs> that that work stream? Right. And then what was so great was you know, some of those problems are going to span across all of your retailers, or maybe it's just one, right? So we would kind of work on like a reapplication matrix where we were able to say, is this a problem that's just going to be for Target or is it going to affect other retailers? So then we could kind of create that work stream, understand where we think the dollar impact lies there so we can prioritize then. Okay, we have this 
slew of 20 work streams we got to understand and where does that one fall within that level of, of projects. Um, and that really set the strategy for us to know, okay, we're working on these projects in this quarter, we'll probably not be able to get to these or this one's too expensive because it's an IT problem or whatever it is. Um, and it really just then, you know, holds people accountable, dry, you know, really creates that collaboration, and then you're able to really make impact. And that's the fun part, right? It's starting to pull your compliance reports and see, wow, we changed how we're routing. And now we're not, you know, getting yeah. whatever's happening in your business, you're able to actually improve. And that honestly was my favorite, favorite part. <laughs> that's, that's just, you're literally blowing my mind right now. <laughs> like how granular you guys got into that. Like that is, that is so cool. I, and, you know, I think we we try really hard. If you guys have been to Supply Fike webinars, you know, we try really hard not to talk about Supply Fike too much because we know you guys are here for the educational content. But I think, you know, I, I just want to throw out there that even if it's not Supply Fike, even if you use a different tool or whatever it is, kind of to Jessica's point, like, getting paid is, is it's table stakes, right? Like that is the number one reason why a lot of people are, you know, trying to get, to get all their money that they, that they are owed from the retailers, of course, but there's a really big, I think, flip side of the coin that a lot of people, they just don't have time or headspace to think about. Like you mentioned, Jessica, mm -hmm. it's just getting paid takes up so much time. It is so tedious. It's so painful, mm -hmm. but if you can kind of stop the bleeding, so to speak, exactly. and, and get the headspace to root cause, to go get 18 people in a room and say, <laughs> what is going on here? Why did this happen? Let's stop it from happening. Mm -hmm. Then hopefully kind of if you zoom out big picture, you know, you're not going to have to be dealing with the same number of shortages or exactly. whatever it is every single month. So exactly. again, you know, I'm so glad that Supply Pike was able to be that tool for you and, and for anyone on the call. Obviously, we try again not to talk about Supply Pike too much. So if it's Supply Pike or another tool, I still think it's important to think about rev loss, you know, in kind of the, the get paid mm -hmm. silo, super important. Yep. But the get better silo is, I think, just as important or even more important. Exactly. Um, I would say. For sure. Because we don't want you know, I think we can keep disputing and disputing, but then it's just a cycle, right? If we're right. not actually fixing what's going on to cause that. And of course we know there's a lot of things that retailers do to cause the deductions as well. And we hope to get that money back, but for things that we can control and there's a lot. And I think sometimes we might assume, oh, maybe, you know, it is, it is uh, valid. You know, we don't want to do anything. It's like, no, this is the time. Take the, take the time out of the day, book that hour, block your time, you know, go heads down because that might actually recuperate way more money for you in the long run than actually spending the time on that, that individual dispute. And that, that would be my one piece of advice as well as you might be focusing like I was on, you know, a small section of your retailer base, but also block some time for those smaller ones. Like if you spend an hour on some of those little guys, there might be some low hanging fruit opportunities that you just didn't have the time for that. You might find, Oh, we're just completely <laughs> our order processing <laughs> for this retailer's completely off based on their, their, you know, their compliance. So it could be little things that we didn't realize we're doing that, you know, we're able to impact quickly and start to get some money back overall. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that, Jessica. So I wanted to do a quick time check in case anyone had some kind of last minute questions that they wanted to submit. So if you guys do, please feel free to go ahead and sub submit that. Um, but I wanted to kind of use maybe our last five, six minutes, Jessica, settlement has been a very big conversation uh, for a lot of the suppliers that we talk to. Um, for those of you guys who are kind of working with Walmart um, and maybe part of the settlement process, um, if you are not already aware, um, settlement is going to be sunset on May 1st. So in like 17 days, <laughs> um, really big deal. Um, and if you're not aware, like, let us know, we will send you all the documentation we have, but I wanted to get your, your pick your brain, Jessica, for a lot of settlement suppliers, um, and even some of the suppliers that are kind of individually disputing today. So, Proof documentation is kind of a new slash difficult concept, um, you know, of like, hey, what do you mean I have to keep track of every single VOL or every <laughs> single POD if I want to go and, and dispute these, these deductions? Could you talk through like best practices at Harry's? Like, what did you guys do to, to digitize them, make sure they were searchable? Like, what did you do there? Totally. 
I think it's, you know, the big piece of advice I would say is just setting expectations with wherever you're getting your documentation from, whether that be a 3PL, a warehouse team, carriers, to be receiving the these documents in a steady, reoccurring time frame. And I and ideally in a place that is easy to access. And like I've totally been there. Like we used to receive our BOLs like via email from our 3PL and to pull each of one of those off and it's got 12,000 pages on it. It's oh, terrible to have to deal <laughs> yeah. with. You know, they didn't have a portal. Totally understand. They were manually scanning them into their system. You know, I think they would purge them after two months, you know, time frame. So I think the big piece again is resetting expectations based on your contract with them. If you have a contract with a 3PL or a carrier, whoever it may be, um, I even wind up escalating it to my internal leadership team and head of supply chain to basically show them and whoever, again, whoever's storing your documents, what the hell that big impact is, right? Like this is right. millions of dollars for some of some of these suppliers, right? Lay out the dollar impact to them and find a process that works for them, right? Like I think take into consideration and be empathetic, right? They're trying to get your product out the door. They have a lot going on. <laughs> they are, you know, the main, main, main point for them is getting your product out the door and on shelf. But also, you know, these documents are a key piece of that, that relationship and contract. So find a process that seems to work for both of you, whether that be a Google Drive or a folder or a system that's going to work for your team. So you can receive them basically in a timely manner. Make sure you're getting every single one. As we know, you don't know which ones you're going to need. And you'll want to make sure that you have access to as many as possible, if not all of them, because it could come down the line. You got a deduction for something that was a couple years old. And you, you don't want to worry that you have this big dollar figure that you're not able to do anything with. So yeah, that'd be my recommendation. Escalate it to leadership if necessary. If they're not you know, willing to play ball, they're responsible for giving you guys that information. So really just set that expectation with them. No, I, I love that. And you bring up a really, I, I really love this key insight too, Jessica, that I think a lot of folks don't, don't realize certain companies, certain carriers, certain 3PLs do have kind of an expiration date on, mm -hmm. on documentation. So right. for example, I think for UPS, they basically purge documents after 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, and so to Jessica's point, like we will be broken records on this. So like, we will still tell you guys this till the cows come home. Yeah. Like make sure, make sure, make sure that you have some way of accessing, downloading and storing documents um, on a regular cadence somewhere on your internal servers, because kind of to Jessica's point, like we have run into suppliers who got that deduction six months ago and they finally had time to go after it because as we all know, retailer portals are the best. <laughs> and you go into UPS, you go into FedEx, it's no longer there. And you know, it's it becomes a nightmare situation. Yeah. Right. So um, you know, and if you guys are on Supply Pike, you know, I just want to assure you guys we are pulling that automatically on your behalf. But if you're not using Supply Pike, make sure you have some sort of method to, exactly. to kind of pull these documents. And don't be uh, afraid to hold them accountable. You know, that's their job. You know, I think like we, I would sometimes assume I was getting them and then realize they stopped sending them to me for a week. And I was like, what's happening? So like, hello. <laughs> yeah, this is, they are the key, you know, of getting money back. So make sure you have access to them. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Jessica, we've got just a couple of minutes left. I'm going to throw our email addresses up on the screen. These are our real emails. So if you guys want to reach out with questions, please feel free to reach out to Jessica or myself. We'll be happy to answer or kind of get you to the right folks. But I guess Jessica, in our last, you know, kind of summing up minutes, um, any kind of last big key takeaways, if, if the team was to walk away from the webinar today, learning maybe one or two main things, what would would you say those key things would be? I would say the two big key things that I would say is really stay close to your team. You know, you guys are all in together. It's not one person that's causing the deduction, you know, and it's no one's, no one's to blame. I think, you know, have a strong team that's able to work together to really collaborate and fight these, you know, your internal team is your team fighting against these retailers. And then I would say, you know, root cause analysis is the key, is really the key to unlocking just future growth for your company and, you know, being able to reduce that impact overall and, and being more knowledgeable about what's going on, whether it be your supply chain or 
IT systems, whatever is happening, even if you find out it's the retailer that's causing it, at least you have that information and knowledge to go forward with, you know, that insight to best, you know, recuperate money and then get better. So I think make sure you're you're allowing yourself. It sometimes you'll feel like oh, I should be disputing right now, but it's like the time that you it'll take to actually understand where it's coming from is so empowering and enlightening and will really make a big, big impact to your business overall once you're able to focus there. Awesome. That is excellent. Could not have said it better myself. <laughs> uh, you guys, if you've again been to a supply pipe webinar before, you know that we kind of again preach the importance of getting paid, go get every dollar, but also make sure that you are focusing on the root cause because that way, you know, you're just going to big picture, have a bigger impact on your company. So I think that is all the time we have today, Jessica. Big Yay. round of applause for your very first webinar. <laughs> Hopefully this was helpful for everybody. Um, if you guys, again, have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Jessica, myself, the Supply Pike team. You know, we are here to support you um, and hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, guys.